But let's focus now on episodic memory and think about um, how uh, the uh, brain systems work to encode these forms of memory. Uh, first example of episodic memory is these autobiographical things, life events, okay, things that actually happen. What, what did I do yesterday? Where did I ride my skateboard today? These kinds of, you know, things I can, I can recall and activate um, that are subjective. But also, uh, when you do kind of any kind of new type of memory that involves explicit knowledge, things, again, that people tell you, um, and facts that you learn in class, a lot of what you're learning right now as I'm giving this lecture, that kind of knowledge is verbally expressed, it's encoded as kind of patterns of activity in your brain, and you're able to encode those new patterns of activity rapidly and kind of grab onto them using the same mechanisms that you use to encode, you know, your, your life events. And so that all fits together in this, in this broad topic of episodic memory. The classic uh, experimental paradigm that's been used to look at episodic memory is to learn about arbitrary paired associates. Uh, in this case, we're going to learn what we call the AB pairs, um, which involve a set of words that are the A part of it, and then the B is this other set of words. So window is the A exemplar for the first pair in our, in our example. Window reason. Uh, bicycle garbage etc and so you just kind of see this these pairs of words you're told to encode them and then you get tested uh, later we'll do that in a second what went with window what went with bicycle etc and then after you learn a B the AB list well you then learn the AC list which is now the same A items but there have uh, been repaired with novel C items now locomotive dish towel ex for example. And the whole uh, kind of uh, importance of this particular paradigm is that this new C item pairing is provides the potential for interference with this previous memory of window reason, right? Because you've got the same item involved in that memory. And so if I were to, as a psychologist would, diabolically go back and ask you, oh yeah, what well, on that first list you were you learned about before, what went with window, okay? And then now you have to go back and remember that B item. What we see is a certain amount of interference. So here's, uh, again, the test uh, that you would see. Window went with what on the AB list? Reason, bicycle, garbage, or was that the second list? Window, locomotive, bicycle, dish towel, or was it dish towel on the first list? I got it, because I wrote this, so I should know, but it's been a while. So if we focus on the left panel over here and ignore this catastrophic word in the title, um, what you see in people is that as you start to learn items on the AC list, as this curve is going up here, you see a systematic amount of interference on items in the AB list. So whereas when you kind of finished learning the AB list, and started learning the AC list, and it's critical that you do all the AB learning first and then do the AC learning so you get this kind of blocked learning of the different items. Um, so when you start learning the AC items, you had perfect memory on AB, uh, and that gets interfered with pretty substantially. You know, you're down to maybe 50% by the time you've uh, had, you know, a number of trials on the AC items and have gotten up to you know, near perfect on those AC items. So we do see evidence that people suffer from interference. But now you can pay attention to this title and this graph over here. This is the phenomenon of catastrophic interference, a very, very dramatic level of interference such that even before we get off the ground on the AC list, the memory, the prior memory for this AB items has completely evaporated, okay? Just been obliterated. So it's really this kind of huge catastrophic level of interference. And this was first documented by McCloskey and Cohen in 1989, and they made a big deal about it, saying, you know, this means that uh, neural networks are terrible. They can't really be a good model of memory because look, here's what human memory looks like, and here's what these neural networks do. 
this is this is a terrible mo model of memory. And again, people always have it in for networks. Like, therefore, you shouldn't study networks. Um, and so uh, we actually had, this is right before I started grad school. And when I got into grad school, I started looking at this problem and working with my advisor, Jay McClelland. Uh, we worked on a, actually a solution to this problem that basically says, actually, yeah, if you look at a standard neural network, it suffers this kind of catastrophic level of interference. But in fact, if you work uh, with uh, different sets of parameters in those networks, you can actually rescue this interference. And this became the, the, the complementary learning systems model that we'll talk about in a second. So our first step though, is to see why it is that the system experiences or exhibits this catastrophic level of interference. And in so doing, we can now understand why it happens and why, how we might fix it and why we might not want to fix it in certain cases. And that's kind of the most interesting thing is that this uh, fixing it may produce a kind of trade-off. It might you know, improve memory, but we might lose something in the bargain. And that's really the key point about the complementary learning systems framework.